so glad that you are here joining us this Sunday morning. If it is your first time watching online, let us know. Horizon donates $25 to Compassion International in your honor. We are still gaining interest in starting a small group study in the new year. Uh, we'll meet twice in the evening, twice a month, and we have a copy on the back table. And the book is called Heaven Meets Earth by the Bible Project. The book is $10, so if there's enough interest, we'll start in a couple of weeks, so let us know. If you'd like to give to support the work that Horizon is doing in our town, you can do so online at relationshipsnotreligion.com. We also have a PayPal available where there is a box on the connection table. And our 2023 donation letters for your taxes will be finished in the next couple of weeks. So we're going to transition into a time of worshiping the Lord
Um, they've done studies on the skeletons that they found of men in the first century from Galilee. He was probably very dark skinned. He had a very dark beard. It was probably a rough beard because he traveled a lot. It wasn't perfectly groomed. His hair was probably cut short, not long, because that's what most of the traveling rabbis had at that time. It's just a very different picture. But we have this picture of what Jesus looked like, and that's because we were handed it from people in our culture. Now, just like we have incorrect ideas about what Jesus looks like, some of us have incorrect ideas about what Jesus is like because people have handed that to us, uh, us as well. The way things that we have taught and books we have read and just kind of the cultural assumptions that we pick up about Jesus, sometimes we can have an inaccurate view of who Jesus is, just like we have an inaccurate view of what he looked like. I think there's a lot of people sitting in churches worshiping a caricature of Jesus who always agrees with them and always supports their politics. He's always in full agreement with whatever they say. He's never angry over their sin. He's always supportive even when they make destructive choices. I think this is perhaps the most sinister of all the idols is a straw man God that we create in our mind and we end up calling Jesus, but he isn't the real Jesus at all. And this isn't a new problem. Let's look at Exodus chapter 32 starting in verse 1. This is going to be our text for today. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol and cast it in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then he said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf, and he announced, Tomorrow we will have a great festival to this Lord. And so the next day the people rose early, they sacrificed burnt offerings, they presented fellowship offerings, and afterwards they sat down to eat and drink, and they got up to indulge in reverie. And then the Lord said to Moses, Moses is up on the mountain talking to you, the real God. Go down because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them. They have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed it to it. And have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. They are stubborn. They, they don't know the way they're supposed to. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. And then I will make a great people out of you, Moses. But Moses sought the favor of Yahweh his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people who be brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? What would the Egyptians say? They would say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them. Um, in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce anger. Relent. Do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. And then the Lord relented, and he did not bring on his people the disaster that he had. All right, so what's happening here? Well, Israel is rescued from Egypt by God, by Yahweh, brought to a mountain of fire, and they're invited to go up and meet their rescuing God, but they are afraid. And so they get to this mountain, the mountain's on fire, and Yahweh's like, you're going to be my people, I'm going to be your God, come up the mountain and meet me. And they're like, no, 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 I'm not going up that mountain, Moses, you go. And so Moses goes up alone to meet with Yahweh. Because they are afraid, they distance themselves from God. Moses has gone for 40 days and 40 nights, and in their mind, they're like, he might have burned up when he went up on that mountain. We don't know if he's coming back. We don't know what's happened to him. It's not like he's been sending carrier pigeons back down the mountain to be like, hey, I'm okay. God and I are still talking. Be back in a bit. They, they don't have any sense uh, of how long it's going to take. In his absence, they get tired of waiting. They've been sitting around this mountain waiting for something to happen. Because they're impatient, they distance themselves from God. And, you know, we do the same thing. Um, drawing near to God often reveals our idols, but distancing ourselves from God invites idols into our life. And notice what made them get distant from God. Fear, first of all, and then impatience. 
And I still think those are some of the biggest things that drive us away from God when we think God isn't rescuing me from this terrifying situation and I'm afraid. If he loved me, he would rescue me from this. Why isn't he coming? And then when we start thinking God isn't acting soon enough for my liking, I keep asking and it hasn't happened. Why is it taking long, so long? Is it ever going to happen? Where is he? When those thoughts start in our heads, many times idolatry is at the door of our Yahweh seemed too dangerous to them. He wasn't working on their time frame. And so they decided to invent a version of him that was more manageable, a safer version that they could manipulate to their liking. They built a God to their specifications. Now notice how clever they were here. They knew they weren't supposed to have any other gods. So they created a new God and called it Yahweh. They created this new God and they're like, this is the God that brought you out of, uh, out of Egypt. Except it wasn't. They went to Aaron, the high priest, the brother of Moses, and he gave legitimacy to their idolatry. And just like today, you can always find some spiritual leader, someone somewhere, who will tell you what you want to hear if you look long enough or hard enough. Confirmation bias means we want to listen to people who already tell us that we're right. You know, like if you have two people, one person contradicting you and one person agreeing with you, guess who you're going to like a little bit more? The one agreeing with you, that's human nature. Confirmation bias means we want to find people who already think like us and affirm what we already think. Just look on Facebook, you know, that's how the algorithm works. They're like, you like people who think this way, we'll let you see all those posts. We won't let you see these ones that contradict what you think. We want to be right, so we're drawn to people who tell us we are. Except, many times in your life and in my life, there's places where we are wrong and we need someone to tell us. So why did they make it in a calf? Have you ever wondered this? Like, why did they make the shape of a calf? Like, Aaron could have made anything. Like, it feels like it's a lot of work to make a calf out of gold. To me, I would have been like, here's your blob. This blob is your god. You know, just throw it in the fire and whatever came out of it. Like, that's it. Not a lot of work. Aaron put a lot of work in this to make it in the shape of a calf. So why? Um, we know from archaeology, the cult of the bull was rooted in Palestine from pre-Israelite times. So people in this area had worshipped gods in the shape of bulls for a long time. There's uh, archaeological finds of bronze bulls in temples from the late Bronze Age in Palestine. Among the Canaanites, the bull was widely worshipped as the lunar bull. In the Sumerian religion, Marduk is called the bull of Utu. In Hinduism, Shiva's steed is Nandi, the bull. So across the world, you see people worshipping bulls. Uh, we still have the sacred bull from some of these ancient religions survived on in our modern constellation Taurus. And they have found bronze bulls throughout Israel. Um, in fact, one was found not that long ago in a sanctuary, with archaeologists were digging it up, in a sanctuary east of Tel Dafon in the mountains of Samaria. And it dates back to around the 11th century before Christ. So about 1100 years before Christ, people were still worshipping bowls in the uh, Palestine area in Samaria. Another possibility of why they did a golden calf is in the ancient Near East, a lot of gods were not pictured on thrones. It's kind of like very Greco-Roman, very Western to think of gods as sitting on thrones. Most of the Near Eastern art suggested gods would sit on animals. And so many times they were depicted as sitting on an ox or sitting on a goat or sitting on different animals and that was their throne and so perhaps this was Aaron's way of being like hey maybe Yahweh's sitting on this bowl but we're going to worship this bowl as our God we don't know for sure but these are some of the possibilities of why he chose a calf but this practice of incorporating idolatry and calling it the worship of Yahweh became a reoccurring theme in the history of Israel. Later, when they adopted Hittite gods like Asherah, the fertility goddess, if you read through the Old Testament, the Israelites kept having this problem with Asherah, the fertility goddess, who they kept worshiping in place of or alongside of Yahweh. Now, Asherah worshippers committed lewd acts around wooden poles on mountains, and as you read through the Old Testament, oftentimes you'll see a good king, and it'll be like, this king followed Yahweh, and he tore down the Asherah poles on the high places where people would go to worship. So they claimed, though, this is how they got around it, the Israelites. They were like, Asherah? That's just Yahweh's wife. And they're like, we're still worshiping Yahweh. This is just his wife. 
for worshiping this one. Yeah, we borrowed her from the Nintendo culture, and yeah, she has all kinds of really weird, sick, perverted uh, practices around her worship, but she's Yahweh's wife, so it's okay. This was their idolatry loophole to make up another god or to borrow another god and somehow incorporate it into their worship of Yahweh. The Israelites were like, we really want to worship the goddess of our neighbors, but we know we're only supposed to supposed to worship Yahweh, let's call her Yahweh's wife and try to legitimize our disobedience. Now, notice what happened here with the idolatry of the golden calf. It almost immediately led them to, according to the NIV, indulge in revelry. Indulge in revelry is a very PG way of saying it got very R very fast. Um, and that's all I'll say about it. Idolatry often opens us up to temptation that we wouldn't usually consider. When we change what we worship, it's amazing when we begin to, how quickly we begin to consider things that we never would before. Changing our definitions of God is often more about excusing what we want to do rather than it is about finding truth. And before we get all the time, I'm Israel, messing up again, terrible job, you know, like, what was wrong with you guys? We do this exact same thing today. We have a human tendency to create a version of Jesus that supports what we already think. This is a safe Jesus that won't ask us to do anything dangerous or unpleasant. Uh, it will offer, this is a safe Jesus that will offer us eternal salvation without requiring anything of us in this life. We have a human tendency to call our idols Jesus in order to excuse ourselves for worshiping them. We think we want a safe, tame God a God that is malleable to our wants and our desires and our ever-evolving sense of societal virtues. A God who we can change instead of a God that changes us. I love this passage from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, from C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. Um, in the Chronicles of Narnia, there is this lion figure. He's a Christ-like figure. And uh, they, they find out they've been going to meet him. And somebody finally tells them, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Susan, one of the children, is like, ooh, I thought he was going to be a man. Is he quite safe? I feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. He's the king. A safe God is a God that we can disobey without any fear of consequences. Jesus isn't safe, but Jesus is good. He is the king. A safe God is too small to help us in the darkest moments of life, but a powerful God must be taken seriously. Notice what happens in this story. Idolatry almost immediately led to their destruction. Within days of receiving the covenant, this promise between God and Israel, between heaven and earth, an invitation to be God's representative to the world and to be the conduit through which he blessed everyone on the planet, Israel was already failing rule number one, to have no other gods, and rule number two, to not make any images of their gods. They were already failing rules one and two, and notice what happens. They deserve consequences for breaking their covenant. In fact, just days earlier, they had agreed, if we break this covenant, we deserve to be destroyed. That was part of the setup. They knew this would happen. But Moses steps in as an advocate. And there's this reoccurring theme in scripture when people choose idols and justice demands they be punished, a righteous advocate convinces God to show mercy instead. Now, some people really struggle with this depiction of God. Like in the story, God was like, I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses said, don't do that. And remember, he gave all these reasons we just read. Like, don't do it because you told them that you were going to do this. Don't go back on your word. Don't do this because people will think bad of you and you're a God of good. Like he goes through all these reasons and God's like, yeah, I won't destroy them. For some people, that makes them feel really uncomfortable. They don't like the idea of a God who changes his mind. But that's the God that's depicted in Scripture. And what that means is our prayers matter. If God's always going to do whatever he wants and it doesn't matter what we say or do, then what's the point of praying to him, right? But this, what's presented in Scripture, is actually a very unique picture of God that none of the other religions on earth can claim. And that says we have a God who wants to partner with us, not just tell us what to do. He wants to have a conversation with us about what to do in our world. 
Imagine if this was a God who, when Moses said, hey, wait a second, what about all these reasons not to destroy them? God's like, I've already decided, and I don't change my mind. I'm going to do what's right, and I'm going to destroy them. That's a very different God than the God in the Bible. What this means, that God can change his mind, that God wants to hear what we think, that God wants to be influenced by our decisions, this means Jesus can advocate for us, because even when we don't deserve it, Yahweh is a God that wants to be convinced to show mercy. Like, if my daughter came to me and she said, Daddy, I'm going to go to Galaxy's Edge, the Star Wars theme park, she wouldn't have to fit, twist my arm, right? I want to be convinced to go to Galaxy's Edge. I want an excuse to spend the thousands of dollars to go to Galaxy Dead because I want to go. That's how Yahweh is. He's ready. He wants to show mercy. He just wants someone to be like, yes, this is what we should do. I don't need much convincing to go to Star the Star Wars theme park, Galaxy Dead. I will go someday. It's going to happen. Um, I just have to slowly, like when Sky's falling asleep, I'm like, Galaxy Dead, Star Wars theme park. Galaxy said, and one day she's going to say it to mom, and then it'll be a thing. Um, I wouldn't need much convincing, and that's the kind of God Yahweh is. He doesn't need much convincing to show mercy to people who fail him. Jesus is a God that defends us in order to bring mercy and blessing to idolatrous people. And this is why our depictions of Jesus are so important, because he's incredibly unique when it comes to how gods are depicted in our world. And we'll talk about this later in the series, but Jesus is just unique. There's no one quite like him in all the gods across time and human history. He is unique. But many times our culture brings him down to just this kind of like, he was a super nice guy. And that's kind of the place he falls into. Really smart teacher with good stories, super nice guy. And he's a little bit more than that, a lot more than that. It's very important that we're not worshiping an idol and calling it Jesus. A few years ago, a candidate was running for governor in Georgia, where Darby's from, um, on a platform of Jesus and guns. And she had big billboards that said, Jesus and guns. And she had this bus, this was her tour bus here, and she would drive around. And when people would ask her questions, she's like, I have a platform, Jesus and guns. Um, it made me think. With the guy who said in Matthew 26, 52, those who live by the sword will die by it. And in Matthew 5, 43, love your enemies. And in Matthew 5, 38, turn the other cheek. Would that guy want his name in bold letters in the same font size next to guns? Maybe. I, I don't think so. But maybe. It's too easy to use the name Jesus as a prop in order to lend spiritual weight to our personal arguments. When Jesus becomes an idea rather than a real person. Voltaire, the philosopher, famously said, God made us in his image, and now we remake him in our image. We're constantly making our idea of God look more like us than it does like him. Our human tendency is towards idolatry, and I think the most common excuse that we make to be idolatrous is to spin our idolatry as devotion to Jesus. We create a Jesus that doesn't exist, then we serve that Jesus, and we say, look how faithful we are. Spinning a story, um, and you're familiar with this term, when you spin a story, politicians do this all the time. Uh, there's like, they, they take something bad and they try to make it good. It means presenting facts or events or situations in a specific way to influence perceptions or opinions. It might involve emphasizing certain details or de-emphasizing or admitting other details or interpreting events in a particular light. Uh, just listen to politicians anytime they talk, and they're constantly trying to spin things. And I think many times we try to spin our, our idolatry as devotion, but it's devotion to a false Jesus. Now, being in ministry, I've known way too many pastors and priests and ministers chasing the idolatry of money and fame and calling it a passion for Jesus. Like, we've got to grow this church bigger. It's got to be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And many times behind closed doors, I quickly realized they wanted to be bigger for them, not for other people, not for God. They spin their selfish pursuits and call it something spiritual. When ministry is your vocation, like it is mine, it's very easy to make worship into a checklist. Like, this is my job. I'm supposed to pray. I'm supposed to study. I'm supposed to do these things. It's very easy for it to become that instead of a passionate pursuit 
Jesus. It's easy to make self-promotion. Like, oh, we need to get more people in here. We need to do bigger and bigger things. It's easy for me to make that say it's about Jesus when really it's about wanting a bigger audience so I can hear a louder applause. So how do we know if we have made a golden calf in our minds, this mental picture of Jesus, and started calling it Jesus when it looks nothing like him? How do we know? In John 14, 8 through 11, Jesus said, well, first Philip, one of the disciples said, Lord, show us the Father. Excuse me. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you since a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father, that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Jesus is saying, okay, you want a clear picture of God? Get a clear picture of me. Jesus claims to be the clearest picture of what God is like. So every image of God has been a pale shadow until Jesus. Jesus is the clearest reflection of what Yahweh is like, how he behaves and how he thinks. So how do we get a clear picture? I think reading the life and teachings of Jesus, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the best way to identify if we've begun to create a false god in his image. Because it allows us to hold our mental image of Jesus up against the stories of those who spent close time with him. It's very easy to read the stories of Jesus partying with sinners and ignore the passages where he calls people to repent. It's very easy to ignore the places where he tells people, you need to change direction because you're living, you're heading towards destruction. You need to live a new way. It's easy to say Jesus was all about love and forget that he also told stories about judgment. Many times I paint an incomplete picture of Jesus in my brain. Um, for the last few years, I've been preaching through the book of Matthew in the summer, and we make very little progress because we're going verse by verse. But there's something about that that's good for me because it forces me to deal with the challenging verses and not just the easy to stomach ones. Being challenged is never anything I enjoy. I like when people are just like, you're right, Alex. I support you. I'm with you 100%. I don't like being challenged. But being challenged actually helps you grow. If you're being challenged when you read the scriptures, that means your mental idea of Jesus is being reshaped. If your gym routine never challenges you, your muscles would never grow. And if your vision of who Jesus is never gets challenged, you probably have an incomplete picture of what he is like. When I was an associate pastor in Tennessee, I was asked by the senior pastor to be involved in some marriage counseling uh, with this young couple. The man was leaving his wife for another woman, and as we talked with him, he said something, and it stuck with me, um, just the audacity of it. He said, look, this other woman makes me happy, my wife and kids don't. I know Jesus wants me to be happy, so I'm leaving her, leaving my wife and kids, and going to be with her. That statement, I know Jesus wants me to be happy, um, that, just, that just echoes in my brain. The vision he had of Jesus was, Jesus wants me to be happy so much, it doesn't matter if I hurt other people like my wife and kids. Uh, this is not the Jesus I see in scriptures, but that's the Jesus that he had in his mind. If your version of Jesus always wants you to be happy, even if it means hurting other people, then you've begun to believe in a Jesus that does not exist. You've created a Jesus that's to your liking instead of accepting and conforming to the real Jesus as he is. Yes, Jesus said he came for the spiritually sick, but he also told people if part of your body is causing you to sin, to cut it off. To present Jesus as our buddy God who always agrees with our political positions and never condemns our greed or our sexuality is to create a Jesus that never existed. It's to make ourselves God and call ourselves Jesus. So three things at the end. When was the last time something Jesus said or did challenge you? As I read through the Gospels, it's been years now. I, I made my first profession of faith around five or six years old, so for 35 years I've been on this path of learning who Jesus is, trying to be with him and become like him. And when I read the Gospels, he still challenges me. There's still things where I'm like, I wish you didn't say that. I wish you had said this. I wish you had done this and not that. 
When was the last time something Jesus said or did challenged you? Number two, when was the last time you did something and thought, this isn't what Jesus would have said or done in this place? Dallas Willard said that becoming like Jesus means thinking about what Jesus would do if he were you in your shoes every day. If he was in your situation as you with your resources, your body, your mind, what would he do in that situation? When was the last time you did something and thought, man, Jesus would have done that differently? Number three, set aside time this week to read through one of the biographies of Jesus' life, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. If you're like, man, I don't want to read through a whole book, read Mark, it's the shortest. If you're like, I love to read, read Luke, it's the longest. Write down some things that Jesus says or does that challenges your vision of him. Because you know what happened to me as many times as I've read the Gospels? Dozens and dozens of times. Every time I reread it, I'm like, oh, I forgot he said that. Oh, I forgot he taught this. I forgot he did this over here. I forgot about this. And it, what it begins is it helps me rework this muddy version of Jesus that I'm so often given in culture and even sometimes in church. And it helps it crystallize in my mind. Jesus is not a made-up, make-believe, mental image of a God. He was a real person. And he just doesn't become anything I want him to be. He's a real person, and I have to conform to him. He doesn't conform to how I want him to be. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming, for living, for dying, for being resurrected and ascending to heaven. And now you advocate for us to the Father. And when we are idolatrous, when we create a version of you that doesn't exist, when we chase after things that will never satisfy us, you look over at your Father and you sent us good when we deserve evil. We're so grateful for your grace. Thank you for advocating for us. God, we also ask that you will forgive us. For often we create a version of you that's palatable, maybe to our friends or our neighbors or our world, sometimes to our own uh, sense of right and wrong. And God, forgive me for so often trying to squeeze you into the box of who I want you to be, instead of just saying, hey, there's some parts of you that are Open up my eyes and wonder and show.